So we're going to go back down to that bottom bar again. And uh, we were on the spray paint can. It looks like a little can little spray paint. If you click on it, it puts it on your cursor. You can see it, but it also opens up the options of what you might want to spray paint onto your images. And so what this does, and here's the, if you click on the arrows, you have different options. So we only have five images in this particular folder. Um, so maybe what, if you had 200, it may be a bigger deal. But let's just give you a sample of what you can do with it. You could spray paint uh, the label, the color ratings, the star ratings, the flags, um, all these different things you could choose or to put it in a target collection by using the spray paint. I think the keywords are a really great use of the spray paint can. And let me give you an example of how it would work really well. Suppose you had a bunch of photos um, and there were different people in different photos and you wanted to keyword, which is a way to search later on if you wanted to search, but you wanted to keyword the pictures with the people in them and we'll say Bob wasn't in every picture, but Bob was in a bunch of them. So you wanted to attach Bob's name to a multiple images, then that's, this is how you could do it. What you would do is just, Click on there, you get the paint can, and then you select, say, keywords in this example. And then over here, you'll, this popped in here too when we selected the can and the keywords. Then here's where we would type in, say, Bob's name. Or because of our photos, maybe we would um, type in Chicago buildings. And we not all of them are buildings, so just one. Or maybe we'll say fountain. That only applies to one of the images. So we'll type that in. Oops, I can't spell. In the dark. Oh, it's a keyboard. It, yeah, it's that keyboard. The keys keep moving. So, and you could do multiple. So we'll say, uh, what describes that fountain picture? Well, it's the fountain, comma, Chicago, uh, and sunset. And you can type all these in. And then all you'd have to do is come up and click on it. And now it has assigned those keywords to that particular image, not to the other four. But, you know, you could change this and say um, the bean. And then Chicago, it was maybe sunset again. I can't remember. And you can apply that to that one. But if there were multiples, then you can just click through 100 or 200 pictures pretty quickly. And knowing what your words are, you could say you could attach them to the appropriate pictures as opposed to having um, Bob's name on a picture that Bob's not in. So that's how this paint can works. And so to put it back, you just click back on the tool. So that's thought. Yes. Later on, say that you had a panel and you had certain people that you clicked on, uh, put the keywords on. How do you really go about doing a search at the beginning when you first open up Lightroom and you want to search for all the pictures with uh, your side of the family? Okay, we'll get to that one. That's coming up real shortly. Um, so let's go on with this bar first. So this is sorting the pictures that are in your folder or in your catalog, whichever the case may be. We'll say folder because we'll go back to the folder. We were on that catalog entry for the... Um, and I tend to like mine in capture time. So in other words, I, you know, I captured this one first and this is the most recent. So however you want it, you can do that. You have some options and these are the options that you could have ordering your photos within your folders. And so you can do a custom order or you can do whatever options they give you. This mine is by capture time. Sometimes I think, wait, these are totally out of whack. Why are they out of whack? And it's because somehow this has gotten moved. Um, but you can also, there's this A to Z, and this means the oldest picture is first and the most recent picture is last. But if I want to switch that order, I just click on that and it will reverse it. So you can change your order back and forth if you wanted to for some reason. And the only other thing that's down here right now is this thumbnail slider, and it, you know, it just controls how big the thumbnails are. 
Yes. I didn't have a uh, paint yeah. And so is there a menu See that, that little I'm... see that little arrow on the far right hand corner? Yeah. So if you click on that, that will give you that click on it and open it. I have go I into know. grid view. Go into G. Hit G yeah. on your keyboard. Okay. Now see that little arrow. Ah, there. So you're showing the arrow too. Yeah. And I don't you you do have the paint can in grid view, see it? You just weren't in grid view. Oh, I see I have to be in grid view. Yeah. Okay. And okay, great. So these bars are different from module to module or even uh, view to view. So this is the grid view and this is the options you have for this. But if we go into the loop view, which you'll get to by hitting the key, uh, E key, or hitting this down at the bottom, you'll see another one of these arrows in the right-hand corner. And if you click on it, it will open the options that you have for this particular bar. And so you can have as many checked or unchecked as you want. Um, and so you can customize it to suit your needs. Can I uh, show one idea that I use, mm -hmm. uh, the color, uh, the color fix. This? Okay, now you see the color fix there? Well, and you can actually go in the menu system and rename what that color means. In other words, I use the purple color for HDR, the yellow for uh, panorama, uh, and I've renamed every one of those. So I've shot a seven, go up and get your pictures back up there now. Bring, bring the, uh, the grid view back up. Thank you. Okay, now, okay, let's say those top four images are a panorama, a series of four. Okay, I don't have to rename those images to say they're panorama, but if I've assigned red as being panorama, I click on that and then go click on the image. The one thing I'll tell you about that, because I was going to teach you how to change these color names. Okay. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. If, if you've been doing Lightroom for a while and you have been using color labels for a while and you go in and you change, because for me, red or green means that picture has been fully edited and sharpened. Okay. And for me, yellow means, so it can mean whatever it means right. to Here you. Okay. So you will make... But the thing is, if you go in, if I went in and changed it, and I did, because I thought, mine used to be like I had an HDR Pano one. Right. And somewhere along at an update, it disappeared. And so um, I didn't notice it for a long time. And so I started using, and, you know, I've continued to use these labels. Well, so lately I thought, I'm going to go in there and name it the way I wanted it again. So I went in and changed the name, because you can, so that when you hover over it, you can see what that color stands for. Instead of just green, it might say it's print ready. Um, but what happened was all mine that were labeled while it was set to green with name the green, all the greens went away. So they didn't leave, but they weren't visible anymore. So what do I mean? So if I marked this one as marked green, and if I go in here to, let's see, where is it? I can't remember where it is. Um, set color label. Right. And I want to, no, that's not what I want. You go to a different one. It's a different one. No. Um, it's up here somewhere. It's a menu up there. You think it's in preferences? I don't. I don't think it is. Maybe it is. Color label set. It is. Of course, they is. So they have default ones, but that said, you can edit. So I clicked on edit, and then hold on. It's just one. I'm going to come back to that. I can't draw. Let me re-green that one. Okay. So now let's go up to metadata. And down to color label set, edit. And now I come over here and I want to type in, we'll just say ready. And then I change it. 
And now look, the green is gone. But it says it here. So now I could mark it, but anything that I had marked over the past years with it set to green wasn't visible anymore. It's not that it was gone. You have to go over in somewhere there's an option for this. And you can find it. Uh, I'm not finding it right now. Um, but anyway, so I just caution you, if you've been keeping it green all this time and now you go change it, you might lose all visible colors that you've had. So I just caution you about that. And if you're going to do it, you would need to look up. It, and I thought it was too much of a hassle to figure out, oh, well, it was green when it was in the default. Now it's Green means something else in this one. And, and I gave up on it, but it's totally up to you, and it is doable. The good news, that hasn't happened to me. <laughs> yeah. That happens as long as you don't change That happens. Because then I, then I can take colors. that color and it's set it up as a collection. The ratings that you have, the options like flags and all that, that if you change those, it can erase everything from the previous. I don't know that you can, what you would change about, um, stars or anything but it just it just i because it has a different title on these um if you are brand new and you've not ever used these color labels yet and you're starting from scratch then go for it i would change them all to fit my needs but i i went back and put them back to the defaults because i didn't want to lose um because they would be there all i would have to do is come back in here get back in there, go to Lightroom default, and then my my green would have been back. This is back to green again. And it would have been there had I showed you that before. But um, so it does it, but just be cautious of what you're getting into. Know what you're getting into before you do it, I guess. The other thing I do to it is I set the colors into collections. So if I want to go up to collections, I can click on panoramas, and I get all my panoramas all together. Yeah. Because it's picking that color that I've assigned to panoramas. And, or and, HDRs, or, you know. Yeah, and so if you can just remember, I mean, I, I rarely hover that, down here anyway, so I just, in my mind, know that my panos are blue. Yeah. Um, and so they everybody has their own assigned color so and we'll get into how you find them by color here in a minute but let's finish with this toolbar so okay so this is kind of talking about the library module if we go into the develop module you again have some another toolbar at the bottom and you also have the option to add or subtract different options that are down there um, i a lot of times will have a color label at the bottom of mine um, what else do I have down there? But you can put what you want. Let me tell you what's here um, that you might not be familiar with. So let's um, say we're editing this image and here are all our images. Let's go actually to one of these. Let's look at this one. And um, these two are similar. So that's why I'm picking this one. And we wanna go into this R-A reference view. What this does, okay, got it, let me explain this, is if I were editing this picture and I wanted it to look just like the other one, I can drag this up here, drop it in. Now I can see them side by side. Now I know how to adjust different colors or maybe it's exposure so that they match. And I can look at them side by side to make sure that I have this active one looking just like the reference one. So it's kind of a cool thing. If you had a bunch of pictures of taken and you needed all of them to have the same color barn in them or tractor or whatever, you can make sure that you didn't tweak the color differently between two pictures. You can look at them side by side. 
Uh, let's look at this next one, and this is um, befores and afters. So you can see what it looked like before, and that's what it looked like after. You can look at this side by side like is, or you can opt for one of these other three. And you can also toggle through them by just clicking on them. It gives you the side by side, top and bottom, and side by side. That one line in the middle of there, that is, a, or this is an up and down. The one line, that's just the wall, so it doesn't break it into quarters. Um, so that's that soft proofing. Yeah, that one, if, if you were going to take this to print, if you hit soft proofing, it opens up a window. No, it usually opens up a window. Up in here. Oh, I'm in. I need to get out of this. Hold on. Sorry, let's clean this up. Okay, back there. Now I'm soft proofing. Still didn't open it. Usually it open it should open a window here. There it is. So it's right under the histogram. And you'd go in and pick your paper that it's going to be printed on. So a lot of times it's used by people that have their own home printers. But if you could use it, if you were printing at a lab and you knew what paper they were using, you could put in the correct paper. And you supposedly would see what this picture will actually look like on that particular paper. And you could make adjustments accordingly, like if it made it too flat or too dull or it needs more contrast or so on, you could make those adjustments. I think it's mediocre at best. So I don't, you know, you can try it if you get to that point. That's what it is. Nevertheless, you know what it is now. Um, we've talked about the pick flags. So if you were doing this in grid view and Culling is what it's called. You can yeah, get into. So we'll start at the beginning and you'd say, OK, this is a pick. It's a not. So you can just go through and hit the P key and it'll assign a flag. And it told you that it did. You can move on to the next image and you can say, oh, I don't like that one at all. And you can reject it. You can move on to the next one and you can decide, you know, if it's a good one or if it's a bad one or you don't have any thoughts on it at the moment, then you don't have to do anything. But suppose you came back to one um, that you had already picked and you decided you didn't want this flag on it. You can unflag it by hitting the U key and it goes away. Remove flag. So anytime you hit the U key, it will, and you selected it, it'll go away. Is there, how do you go through there, like you have uh, 400 pictures, and you go through the wall and decide which ones you like, which ones that you want to get rid of, and then be able to delete them all at once, you know, all the bad ones? How do you go okay, about? so if we, we'll say we had, um, we'll just select these. And he said, you know, and I was going to go over this anyway. So, and these are all de marked for deletion. So they're rejects. I put the X key on them. So what I can do is making sure that I really want to delete those four, I would then go up to photo at the top here, click on it, and all the way to the bottom, and there is a shortcut, but I usually do this. I want to make sure I'm accurate. It says delete rejected photos. So I could hit delete. I don't really want to delete them. Um, and it will actually, I think it will give me a, a window and says, do you want to delete it from the drive, uh, the hard drive or, well, okay, I'll do it. I don't think, because I don't think it'll go away. Please don't go away. <laughs> okay, so it'll say delete from disk or the other one is just remove them from uh, the Lightroom catalog. So you can choose here or you can cancel out. And so I would cancel out. So, okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit more about um, this stuff up here. So this library filter bar, it says text, attribute, metadata, and none. Right now it's on none. So it's filtering by nothing specific, just sorted by capture time, but all pictures are visible. Let's get rid of those for right now. Um, so if we went up to text, if you keyword, 
you hit the word text, it will bring open this little bar. And in it, you will see that you can select here what fields you want it to work on. Is, are you searching by file name, copy name, or whatever? So, or any searchable field. So you can have, you'll select that. And then you'll go over here and you can select, it says contains all, or it just contains, or it contains words. It doesn't contain. So you get to set up the parameters for which you are searching. If you don't, if you want it to contain every word that you're going to type in there, then you would have contains all. Otherwise, maybe it's just you might type in Chicago and it, it will have just the one word come up or something that finds it. So you can choose what you want to be in there, what works with it. Starts with, ends with, however you're doing it. And then over here is where you would type in your search. So Chicago or yellow, whatever it might be, you know. Chicago Fountain, Buckingham Fountain. And if I had highlight, you know, then it would search out and find this only within this folder. Why? Because just this folder, because that's the one I've highlighted. This is what's over here and highlighted. So it's only going to look in that folder. So there's other ways to search. So let's look at the attributes, which I find a nicer way to search. And nothing came up. All those pictures just disappeared. And why? because up here there's a one star checked and I obviously didn't have any images that one star. So if I just click on this again, they'll all come back. So you can see all of them. Um, but we'll say we wanted to search by, oh, and then this is checked too. So let's get that off of there. Cause I say we got, we should have more. So what this did is this is that thing that it was unlabeled. It was, you can find these these two things are where you can find it if you've changed that color label name. It has to do with those two things. So, but anyway, we'll say we want to search by green ones because those are the ones ready for print. So I would just go to this one and okay, this is the one I'm ready. It's ready to do whatever. Maybe I want to put it in a collection of finished vacation pictures and I could do it that way. So if I had, um, let's take that off and say we had um, selected another couple and we'll say these were all green now. By the way, there's keyboard shortcuts for the numbers too, which are on that list that I gave you. And now I searched for here, then you'll see that it brings up just the green ones. So if I search by stars, let's just make, we'll say this is a three. And because they're all highlighted, look, it changed all of them. So let's say this is a three, we'll go to this being a two, and we'll make this a one. Okay, so if I search by stars, and I click just the first star, it'll have all three of them up there, because it's one star or more, and it will select those. And this one, in this case, it's one star or more plus green is what it has to be. If I went to two stars or more, then you can see the one star dropped out. If I had three, then it's three stars or more, and so I'm down just to the one. And then you can just totally click out of it if you want. Um, so that's, and if I wanted to search by picks, then I hit the pick flag, and so that one's the only one that had a white flag. If I click it again, it'll go away. If I clicked for deleted, then it's only bringing up the one that has a delete flag on it. And if I click for the unflagged, it'll bring up everything except for the two that had flags. Okay, so that's how you use that. Now, metadata, there's two things I'm going to show you on this one. My brain just stopped working for a second. How did you get to that search area? Uh, oh, just this? You mean this whole bar or what? Yeah. Totally. It's on there and it's open. I usually have it open all the time. If you don't have it up there, then go to your view and click tool. It, mine says if I clicked it now, it would be hide toolbar, but I want it to show toolbar. It's the very first one. Yeah, top. In, in grid view. Uh, are you in grid view? Uh, G, hit G. It should the top to it should say so, show to your toolbar. So filter bar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Does everybody got that bar up there now? 
So if you click on metadata, it opens this, and this is by default the way it sits. So you can see it tells you dates that these pictures were taken. It tells the cameras that were used on these pictures, all the different lenses. And so you can search by this. So I can say, I only want to see the pictures that I took on the Z7. So I'll click that, and then it'll, it filters down to just that. Um, you can also choose to, like this is by date, but if you don't want to have a filter up here by date, you have options. You can click those double arrows and you can pick anything, filter any way you want. I tend to use this date one, so I would leave it date for myself. Matter of fact, I just, I don't use this too much. I never search by lens, but um, sometimes these two will be helpful. So that's how you would search within one folder. Bring up one point on this particular one with the metadata. Yeah. That's actually a Boolean math type search page. It's an if and or. So okay. you can go down, say, in that first column, you can pick numerous different things in that first column. That would be an or. It would show or this one or that one. If you want to see this and another one, that's where the second column. Oh, yeah. So you can continue to add. So like I, I, what he's saying, if you didn't get it, so I could say, well, I want one that was, let's see if I can do this, maybe shot in February. Eh, see, I knew that would work for this small little search. search. Let's, uh, okay, there's three pictures here. We'll see if this will work. So I want one shot in 2018. And then, oh, I want the ones on my Nike. So then it goes down to that. So Two of them were with the ZXT2, and so only one of the three that were shot in 2018 fall into this parameter, and that's what you were saying. It's an and-or type of thing. So, so that's, yeah, I've noticed that I didn't think about telling you about it, but I have used it in that manner. Um, so let's get back to here a second. Now, this is for this folder only, but you know what? If you have... You know that in your catalog somewhere, you took a picture at some point in time and you can kind of remember, but you don't remember exactly. You can go up and you don't know where to find it. Which hard drive does it live on? If you go up to this catalog section and open it up, you'll notice it says, the very top one says all photographs. And on this one, it might say 80 pictures. I can't really read that. But I would click on this one and it's showing me all the pictures that are on in a catalog in this Lightroom. And now I said, well, I wanna go and I wanna go to my metadata section and I want, see there's pictures from all these different years that are in this catalog. And I'll say, well, I think I shot one in 2015. Yeah, it was in the winter, it had you know, what was in this one? And you can find, oh, it was that picture. Um, so you can search that way and find out where it is. So then you say, well, I want to know where this picture is. If you right click, it'll, you can say show and explore and it'll tell you where or go to the folder in the library. So it'll actually bring the library up to the point. So you can you didn't know where it lived and you that's the exact picture you wanted and now you you know it's there you just have to find it this is the way to go to, so go to the collection if you think it was in a collection if you you know you can go to the library and find it or you can find it in your file system in explorer so you have some options there are there any questions about that let's go back down here all right so that's how you use that filter bar, and I use it a lot. Now, the film strip mode's been open for a while, and we, we will talk about just enough to tell you that it does some different things you should check out. You can bring up a second window, and it, you, can add, it tell, you can see what it, type of window it can be. Yeah, you can. Oh, it came up on the other screen. So that's why it'll bring up a, a second little window. And this will just be the one main window. So I keep hitting that thing. So um, those are options that you have down there. This is simply if you were in loop view. Um, 
on your main screen and you hit this little grid thing, it'll take you back to the grid view. If you were hitting these arrows, it'll be whatever screen you had up last. If you go backwards and you can keep going backwards and then you can go forward. So it's just going through whatever steps you've made. This is telling you what folder is showing in the film strip, what, how many photos are in it, you've only got one selected, and what the name of that one that's selected is. So you've also got these filters that you can filter by over here, so you can filter in this slide, excuse me, film strip, just like you would filter in this grid view. You can do the same thing by clicking on stars, picks, or colors. So let's, you know, just try some of these things. They are um, not that big a deal. Now, on your uh, syllabus that I gave you, number four is troubleshooting. I've had this happen to me, and I, I can't see. Let's see if I can see it. I don't know that you can see it, but there's usually a bar up above here, which is, the way you close out. This would be for Mac users. This is up here in this one, so I close it here. But sometimes the little minimize bar goes away on my screen, and this may just be for Mac users. So if you're a Mac user, and that little minimize bar goes away, the way you get it back is Shift plus F. That's a troubleshooting thing that I've had to look up every time. If you could change the screen. To full, you mean in that yeah, section? Either. Yeah, so if you just hit the F button, and I think accidentally before I've hit the Shift F button when I was just wanting a full screen, and then I accidentally got rid of my minimize bar. So if you need to bring it back, you just hit Shift F to bring it back. Um, okay, so let's talk about going to the develop module here again. And we don't have a whole lot of time. We've already talked about the previous button before. We're not going to get to, well, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. We can talk about um, range masking or how to make a watermark. Which would you rather do? Range masking. I think that's probably more useful. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Uh, another one was, I, I was going to do slide shows, but today, it, Lightroom said something about it. Slideshow. Mm -hmm. Does this uh, do a slideshow? Yes, it does. Uh, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> it will do one, um, and you can even add music to it and such. But I've never, I honestly have never done a slideshow in here. Yeah, I've done it in uh, a different program. <laughs> so let's suppose that we wanted to do something to this picture, and I'm going to draw a gradient filter down. How did get that? I went to the gradient filter up here in the, um, so I had my picture, I clicked on the gradient filter up here, and then it's just my, I'll uh, get rid of this. We'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the cursor looks like an X. I just click and drag down to get that down there. And then I can reposition it by clicking on the dot and pulling it into place. So we'll say we have it here. And I want to darken that sky. Wow. Um, and we'll just make it fairly dark. And now, well, it made the buildings dark too. And I don't want the buildings to be dark. So if you look at the bottom of this panel, and this is in um, the graduated and the radial and the adjustment brush, you will see this range mask option. And if you click on it over here, it says off now, but if I click on it, I'll have th oops, three options. And every time I've ever looked at anything, depth is never a available, so it's always grayed out. So I looked it up to see when it was useful because I thought I needed to be able to tell you about this, but it's like I didn't know because I've never been able to use it. Why, why isn't it? And I finally was curious enough to look. Well, it only works with certain select smartphones right now that actually take pictures so that you can use this depth of field um, as a masking. So 
I'm just telling you, if you don't have like one of those two camera, was it two camera phones that has the two different lenses on it that you won't you know, like, I think it's the seven plus the eight plus or whatever they call it. And then the tens all have the ability to take a picture with the step of field if you have it turned on in your camera, in your phone. So anyway, for us, all we can use with our regular DSLRs are color or luminance. And in this case, we know we want the blue sky to stay and the buildings not to be affected. So I'm going to hit color in this case. And you'll see this eyedropper come up. And then there's a slider. And you can also click on this to show your mask if you want to. But if we click on this eyedropper, I'm going to bring it over and I could just click on a point and it will mask out pretty decent, but it doesn't always work. This, this um, uh, sky is pretty much similar color, I guess. Whoops. All right, let's do this again. Draw down the gradient. Sorry for the glitch. Let's bring down the. All right, so now let's uh, get back into the range mask color. What works a lot for the sky, since it's all blue, is if I hit my eyedropper and I do drag a square out. It will get a variation of that color and that will help it pick better than just a single point. And so now let's look at what that overlay looks like. So you can see what's being affected, just the blue sky and where it was reflected in these windows. So we could get rid of it everywhere if we wanted to, um, but with this, we are probably stuck at this point. So I would put this back. Um, you can work on smoothing and it does help to smooth it sometimes um, a little bit. So it will just make it so it's not such a sharp cutoff. But I'm going to turn this uh, overlay off so we can see the blue. Well, let's leave it on actually. I could come back up here now and grab the brush, not the brush tool, but the brush and erase. And now I could come in and, and manually erase where it was affecting the, re you know, that sky was reflecting in that building. So if I wanted to remove it from areas like that, I could come in and, but it does a really nice job of cutting around these buildings if you notice how it, it snapped to right immediately. So this is a really good example of how it will do that um, with color. So let's look at a different example with luminance, and we'll do this image. And we'll say the same thing. We want to darken this sky. And I'll go ahead and draw down another gradient. And I'll come over the mountains a little bit because it's an uneven edge. So um, if I want to darken down the sky a little bit, but I don't want it to darken down those mountains at all, I can also use the luminance one and it will put up a different slider and you can show luminance mask. So right here, this one gives you a mask that you can turn on and you can see what you're doing. So you can pull and now it's taking it off the light area, which we don't want to do. So that would be removing the light is on the right. Removing the dark area is on the left. And you can see it really cleans up that what's on those mountains. And again, you can adjust the smoothness so that it's not such an abrupt change. By going left, it's more intense and to the right, it's less. So you can adjust that if you feel like it needs to be. But that's how um, these masks work. And it's pretty fast and pretty slick. And some scenarios work much better than others. Um, I had a picture that I had brought in that is, where did we put that? Hmm. Where did we load that stand, do you remember? 
Obviously, it wasn't in there that one of them. Huh. Well, I had another one I was going to show you, but it's irrelevant. It would do the same thing. Um, when you use that radio tool, when you slap that up there, you can also do a slower fade by widening that out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Let's go back. There it is. Uh, so it was on this one. Now I just, there's the point right there. Okay. So, yeah, if you want this, you just pull these in tighter. Or you can pull them farther apart. And that adjusts. That's how you adjust the feather on a gradient. And, uh, there was one other trick on that. It was, I think if you push... Uh, when you put that gradient on there, if you hold the shift key in, right, it, it'll actually do a straight across. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we talked about that. It's like if you hold the shift key and draw it down, then it comes straight down, and you can't can't swing your cursor to get it to swing. Where if I now let off on the shift key, I can move it however I want. So. Uh, yes, the shift key. The shift key does things like that. Shift key will bring down straight. It will make a perfect circle. Different things like that. So, um, that's all I have time for. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get through watermark. I was going to, you can go into, we talked about it briefly when we were doing the exporting the other day. You can go in and set up a watermark. So um, we can do this some other class time to work on watermarks. Um, yeah, we could. We could have a whole class on it. Um, some of the things that we didn't get over was the HSL panel. That's pretty self-explanatory. So go in and play with it. You can change colors. You can change the luminance. And you can change the um, saturation on individual colors, which can be very helpful. And we didn't talk about the tone curve. Again, that's something you can play with and see how it works. So we did get a lot of information covered in four classes. There's so much more I would have loved to have taught you. Just doesn't fit in four classes. Um, but there's still a lot out there that we could do. But um, this is the basic. <laughs> What's that? My brain is is it? You need a you need a few I months to let it settle.